Alright guys, Dominic here for Kit Guru, and today we are checking out something quite unique. This is a 5.7 litre water-cooled mini PC produced by Geekom in collaboration with smartphone manufacturer Techno. Now, Geekom claims the Mega Mini G1 is the world's smallest liquid-cooled gaming mini PC, packing in a GeForce RTX 4060 and Intel Core i9-3900H alongside 32 gigs of memory and a 2TB SSD. It certainly looks the part, but today we find out exactly how it performs and whether or not it's worth buying at the $1,900 asking price. The first thing you need to know then about the Mega Mini G1 is that it's actually currently up on Kickstarter. There is a choice of two models, so you can also get an i7 model, which is slightly cheaper. However, the i9 model that I'm reviewing here is the top of the line option, and it is currently up to backers for $1,799, though once the campaign ends, its full MSRP is $1,899. In terms of its design then, the Geekom Mega Mini G1 makes a great first impression. Not only is it very small, measuring just 255 by 150 by 150 millimeters, giving it a 5.7 liter capacity, but it still feels robust thanks to the use of metal panels. Of course, what really grabs your attention though are those four U-shaped tubing runs that you can see through the windows. They give the G1 a very unique and futuristic vibe, and of course, the very fact that it's a custom cooled setup in a PC this small is very cool indeed. You can imagine my disappointment then to later find out that the visible tubing you can see from the front of the G1 is basically fake, or in Geekom's words, it's entirely decorative. That means it's actually a completely separate loop from the actual water cooling setup, which is basically a compact all-in-one, which is contacting both the CPU and GPU. It's, like I said, it's an entirely self-contained loop. It does nothing practical, and it's there purely just to look good. On top of that, it's not even been filled all the way as there's noticeable gaps in the water. So when it's turned on, you just get a lot of air bubbles and it really doesn't look right in my opinion. Now that doesn't actually affect cooling performance as it would in a normal setup as the decorative loop, as I said, is completely separate from the actual cooling loop. However, it does definitely detract from the overall appearance. You will also have noticed the RGB lighting with zones around the 120mm fan inside the system and there's also LED strips running around the windowed panels. As it happens, control of the lighting is minimal at best. You can turn those LED strips off but the RGB fan always has lighting enabled and there's no way to configure the lighting effect or colour. It's a similar story as well for the LED screen at the top of the front panel. Initially, I thought this was a pretty cool feature, giving users a quick and easy way of looking at both CPU and GPU metrics, that sort of thing. However, it quickly became clear that there's no way to configure what's on the screen at all, and it also seems to think that the system has 70 gigs of RAM when it has 32, so it doesn't seem particularly accurate either. Round the back though, we find plenty of ventilation cutouts in the metal as this is where the all-in-one cooler's fan exhausts hot air and then there's also the rear I.O. panel at the bottom. To Geekom's credit, this is a very full I.O. with plenty of USB ports as well as four more round the front alongside two USB 4 Type-C ports, Ethernet and even an Oculink which Geekom claims can offer 63GB per second bandwidth and could be a way to connect a faster external graphics card down the line. My main disappointment here though in terms of the I.O. is with the HDMI ports. There are two, but weirdly they're limited to HDMI 2.0 and not HDMI 2.1, despite of course the RTX 4060 fully supporting HDMI 2.1. That means I personally actually wanted to connect the Geekom G1 to my LG OLED TV, which can do a 4K 120 mode. However, I was limited to 60 hertz due to the lack of bandwidth, so for me, that just seems like a completely weird omission. I personally would have thought quite a lot of people might be wanting to hook up this sort of machine to a TV, in which case 4K 120 sounds like a great idea, but sadly, it's not possible. 
Moving on though to taking the system apart, this is done in parts and initially I thought it was quite straightforward. You first remove the four rubber feet from the underside of the machine to reveal the four screws holding the bottom panel in place. That pops off and there's a couple more support brackets to remove before you get access to the underside of the motherboard. Here we can access the two SODIMM slots which are each occupied by a 16 gig module in this instance. While there's also one 2TB Fizon E2070 M.2 SSD installed and there is a spare M.2 slot next to it though this is limited to 2242 drives and not full size 2280 M.2 drives. The next stage if you want to remove the motherboard is taking out a bunch more screws and carefully unplugging a bunch of headers and connectors and that reveals the Raptor Lake die on the other side of the motherboard as well as the VRM layout. Underneath the motherboard you can also get a look at the water block that contacts with both the CPU and GPU in kind of like a sandwich style and you can also see that the more boring looking black tubing is part of the actual water cooling loop. Now I didn't remove the GPU but it is actually an MXM module, something that's pretty rare these days so while an upgrade is theoretically possible I have absolutely no idea if you'd actually be able to find a standalone MXM card and it's certainly not the most straightforward process to get access to the GPU. Just before we move on though, it is quickly worth confirming the core spec of the machine. So as mentioned, it is using Intel's i9-3900H, which is of course a Raptor Lake CPU, and this is a mobile part, offering 6P cores and 8 E cores. It is however of course now a last generation part. I did actually reach out to Geekom and ask them why they opted for a 13th gen CPU, and they told me it was basically down to what was available at the time they started this project. They did seem to suggest that a 14th generation version may or may not be on the way, but this is it for now. Alongside that though, of course, we have the RTX 4060 and that's running at stock clock. So that's a 2460 megahertz boost clock. And we also find 32 gigs of DDR5 memory clocked at 5200 mega transfers per second. And that is CAS latency 42. If you're looking for a new chair, then you should definitely check out Boolies. I'm currently sat on their Ninja Pro gaming chair, which is one of three models from their gaming series alongside the Elite and the Master. So if you're looking for something new to stick in your setup that you can sit on and game and work, then I recommend definitely checking out boolies.co.uk. That is it though for our look at the design of the machine, but before I move on to all of our testing, it is worth quickly just going over a few other performance related details, as well as going over the two performance modes in the BIOS that I tested. I did actually get two BIOS updates during my time with the G1. The latest version which I did all of my testing on was version 1.02, Though Geekom does tell me that this update will already be installed on any retail units. The BIOS itself however, as you can see here, looks absolutely ancient, straight out of the Windows XP era and there's very few settings that you can actually change. The only real thing of note is the power mode setting where there's a choice of quiet, normal and performance modes and I tested the latter two and I'm going to break down the differences in just a minute. Before we get to that however, it is also worth taking a quick look at the fan control software that Geekon provided. Again, this looks incredibly janky, it doesn't appear to have an English version, and to use it you actually have to hit the start button, then choose which fan speed percentage you want to apply to fan 1 or fan 2 with fixed increments, then hit the right button to actually apply the setting. Out of the box the system does have some sort of auto fan curve but there's actually no way to edit the curve itself. If you want to use the software and set something manually you have to pick one of those 10 speed increments. Moving on though to talk about power modes, as mentioned I did test both the normal and the performance mode from within the BIOS, though it's important to note these will only affect the CPU power limits and do not affect GPU performance in any way. Starting with the normal power mode which is the default, this has a PL2 of 115 watts but it can only sustain that figure for about 5 seconds in Cinebench, briefly hitting 4.3 GHz on the P cores before dropping back to the 45W PL1 and a 2.9 GHz clock speed. After 30 minutes of that it was rock solid at 2.9 GHz and had a steady state temperature of just over 50 degrees with the peak of 80 degrees coming during the initial boost period. In games the CPU would also draw about 45 to 46 watts but bounce between 4.1 and 4.2 GHz on the P cores with package temperatures never exceeding 80 degrees. The performance mode however definitely cranks things up a level with a 120 watt PL2 where the CPU hit 4.4 GHz on the P cores in Cinebench before dropping down to the 100 watt PL1. 
However, even after a minute or two of Cinebench, I noticed certain cores were momentarily dropping clock speed down to 2.5 GHz, and after 30 minutes this was a very obvious occurrence in the performance mode. CPU package temperature was around the 82 to 85 degree mark, so I don't think it was thermally throttling, but it's possibly a VRM issue with the tiny laptop grade hardware, perhaps not capable of sustaining the higher power draw, with the actual package power now more like 85 watts at the end of the test. In Cyberpunk 2077, I didn't see this issue as clearly, but clock speeds were still bouncing around between 4.5 to 5.1 gigahertz. Temperatures, however, were much more problematic in this mode while gaming, regularly hitting in the upper 90s and peaking at 102 degrees in my testing, and clearly that is just way too hot for comfort. As for the GPU, however, in-game it was pulling about 120 watts, which is to be expected for an RTX 4060, and it's clocking at between 2760 to 2775 megahertz, with the GPU temperature at 68 degrees and a hotspot just below 80 degrees. And like I said, this is not affected by the power modes, as they only adjust CPU parameters. With that testing done then, my recommendation is definitely to stick with the normal mode, which is actually the default, as I mentioned. You will lose out on a bit of performance due to the relatively conservative 45 watt PL1. However, that way you're not dealing with temperatures hitting over 100 degrees and you're also not going to have any dips in clock speed down to 2.5 gigahertz as we saw in the performance mode as normal was completely rock solid in my testing. Total system power draw is of course higher in the performance mode as we'd expect, hitting 255 watts while gaming, so that's about a 40 watt increase over the normal mode. As for noise levels, they are definitely on the louder side, but I wouldn't say they're terrible, it's about similar to a gaming laptop. Of course, a full-size desktop could be configured to be significantly quieter, especially as the hardware in the G1 is relatively low power, but that is always the compromise for small form factor. Moving on though to our actual system benchmarks, we're kicking things off with Cinebench R23 Multicore, and here we can see that there is a difference in performance between the two power modes on offer. In this instance, the performance profile delivers about an extra 16% over the normal mode. Both results, however, are relatively slow by modern standards, particularly in comparison to Intel's current flagship mobile CPU, the i9-4900HX. As we'd expect though, the single core test shows a much smaller difference between the two power modes, with performance coming in just 2% faster than normal. In both cases, the score is as expected for the Raptor Lake architecture. By sticking with Raptor Lake, however, and the relatively slow memory limitations that come with the platform compared to newer systems, the Mega Mini G1 doesn't offer the fastest memory speeds with read and writes coming in just over 70,000 megabytes a second. By comparison, LP DDR5X systems can actually get closer to 90,000, even 100,000 megabytes per second. As for PC Mark 10 though, these results are again about as expected, though it's interesting to see the performance mode does make a bigger difference here, bumping up the overall score by 26% compared to the normal mode. As for 3D Mark Time Spy, the graphics score here is obviously set by the RTX 4060 GPU and this doesn't change regardless of the power mode used. However, we did see again a sizable increase to the CPU score when using the performance mode. Now I also ran Crystal Disk Mark on the SSD and speeds are as expected for a Gen 4 drive, topping out at about 7GB per second read and 6.5GB per second write. Next up then, we're coming on to our game benchmarks where I am looking at both 1080p and 1440p. However, I did also test a couple of in-game presets as 1440p max out isn't always going to be viable on the Mega Mini G1. Starting things off then with Black Myth Wukong, this is obviously a very demanding modern title and at 1080p very high settings, we're barely getting over 30 FPS. Using the medium preset, however, is a lot more like it, and we can see performance closer to the 70 FPS region, give or take as the benchmark runs through different areas. 
At 1440p in Black Myth, the medium preset is okay. The frame rate is more like 45 to 50 FPS now, but it is much better than the low preset in my opinion, which really changes the look of the game. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 is next, and as we'd hope, this runs incredibly well, even at 1080p ultra settings. We're talking 80 to 100 FPS depending on the on-screen environment. You can even jump up to 1440p ultra settings and still be around the 60 FPS mark, or you can lower things down to the basic preset and enjoy frame rates that are typically over 100 FPS, if not higher. Meanwhile, in Cyberpunk 2077 at 1080p ultra settings, we've got no problem delivering a 60 FPS experience in the demanding indoor area, and this rises to over 90 FPS once the benchmark moves into the alleyway. 1440p Ultra is a lot tougher though, and we saw dips into the 30s, but if you want to enable the medium preset, this will keep you nice and smooth above 60 FPS, closer to 70 FPS, as we can see here. Next up is Forza Horizon 5. It's a very well-optimized title, and 1080p Ultra sees the Mega Mini G1 hit 100 FPS during the initial area of the benchmark, and this does increase further as we move out of the city area. Even 1440p Ultra is very smooth, hovering closer to 90 FPS if not more, and you can always use the medium preset to get frame rates above 150 frames per second. Up next we have Horizon Forbidden West, and at 1080p very high settings, we do see some fluctuations, but it's still solid enough to deliver a 60 FPS experience, but often higher depending on the scene. At 1440p we do see dips down into the 40s, especially when Aloy appears on screen, but using the medium preset instead brings frame rate closer to 60 FPS, though it still isn't perfect. Lastly then, I'm going to close out with Starfield, and even 1080p Ultra is too much for the G1. You'll need the medium preset for frame rates around the 60 FPS mark, though this is admittedly a particularly GPU-heavy scene in the forests on Jemison. Even at 1440p medium settings, we only see frame rates in the mid-40s, but of course, there is always still DLSS to fall back on if you need it. That brings us to the end of this review then, and by now, you've probably worked out that I am not too impressed with the Geekom Mega Mini G1. For me, there's just way too many annoying things and downright concerning issues with this system for me to be able to recommend it. I'm talking things like CPU package temperature hitting over 100 degrees using the performance mode, as well as frequent clock speed drops down to 2.5 GHz. There's things like the ancient looking BIOS, the janky fan control, the lack of HDMI 2.1, which is completely baffling to me. And then you've also got things like the fake water loop, which I personally find to be quite deceptive if you're advertising this as a water-cooled PC to have an entirely self-contained water loop system that isn't actually anything to do with the cooling setup. To me, it just seems like a very weird move. On top of all of those issues as well, and there are more that I haven't even mentioned in this conclusion, I just can't get over the price being charged for this level of hardware. The i9 model of the G1, for instance, is going to retail for $1,899 once the Kickstarter campaign ends, and that's roughly £1,440 at the time of writing. For the same money, I actually spec'd up a system with a Ryzen 5 7600X and RTX 4070 Super, and of course that is going to be miles faster at the same price. Alternatively, a system with a spec similar to the G1 with an i5-12400F and RTX 4060 could be built for less than a grand, and that is still going to be faster as it's a proper desktop CPU, not a lower power laptop part. Clearly, the G1 is being targeted at those who want a tiny PC but with a strong novelty factor. I'm talking things like the decorative loop and RGB lighting. I will give them that, I do think it looks the part, but upon further investigation it's hard to come away with any other conclusion that the beauty is only skin deep. That is going to do it for this review though guys, so if you liked it please do toss me a thumbs up and as always let me know your thoughts on this system down in the comments below. While you're there please do subscribe if you haven't already and ding that notification bell so you don't miss when we upload a new video and if you want to carry on the conversation you can do so in our discord server which is linked down below. While you're there, you'll also find a link to our merch store where you can help us out by picking up a cool t-shirt like the ones on screen. And if you're feeling particularly generous, you can even consider backing us on Patreon. That's it for this one though, guys. I'm Dominic for Kick Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.